Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it. With the new Galaxy S24 Ultra and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. Hi there, Duke fans. Episode 403. Folks, this will be a memorable one. We're going to tell you definitively everything that's going to happen in the NCAA tournament. We're going to pick the champions. You got it. It's like it's done. Write it in stone. What we say will be the truth. Either that or we'll be wildly incorrectly wrong, which is what usually happens. Anyway, (laughs) it is time for our NCAA tournament preview. I am Jason Evans here to steward the ship through this minefield that is trying to figure out which teams are going to win, which teams are going to lose, and how Duke is going to do and all that other stuff. Joining me, as always, my good buddies, my partners in crime, Donald Wine and Sam Klein. Donald, back in D.C., right? I am back in D.C., and, and as for the brackets, a lot of people understand that where, where I come from, 60% of the time, I'm right every time. So everything I say on this show is the 60% where I'm going to be right the entire time, unless I'm wrong, in which case, forget everything I just said. Uh, yes, that sounds like me as well. Sam Klein. Sam, what do you think you're picking percentages 60 percent about right <laughs> i think uh i think george carlin said that he prays to joe pesci because joe pesci because I, I i believe it's he prays to joe pesci rather than god because they're right about the same amount of time or or, or like it's effective about the same amount of time um and he just effective, prefers yeah 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 exactly I, I i need to pull up the the full quote now that we're talking about it what? i i don't presume to be right about anything um what is joe pesci funny is is he a funny guy does he he's a funny guy does he amuse you i need to i need (laughs) to pull up the exact george carlin quote because i really really and i anyway we're not going to make this a whole uh we're not going to make this a whole philosophical religious podcast but um but i do like george carlin so uh yes i I generally i generally trusted what he had to say yes uh, uh goodfellas george carlin these are all things that that work with far more success than our picks do, but we're going to nonetheless uh, attempt to brave our way through it. Folks, I just want to give you sort of the rundown. Here's how we're going to break all this down. We're going to we're going to give you a really deep dive, first of all, on Cal State Fullerton, Duke's first opponent. We're going to preview that game because I don't care if you're a 16 seed, a 15 seed, or, uh, you know, a, a, a really important number one or number two. Uh, the team needs to focus on the, the opponent right in front of them, and the uh, team right in front of Duke is Cal State Fullerton. So we're going to do that first. We're going to look also at Duke's bracket and um, and talk about what the keys are for Duke's success. And then we're also going to get, you know, a little later into the rest of the field, the ACC teams, the rest of the bracket, and we'll wrap it all up at the end with our final four picks. But we begin with Cal State Fullerton. And uh, guys, we're going to do this the way we always do. I'll do the advanced stats. Sam's going to tell us about some of the players. And Donald, you get to start by talking to us about just this team's record and, you know, who they've beaten, who they've lost to all that kind of jazz. Give me a preview of what we should expect from Cal State Fullerton. I think the answer is they haven't really played anybody that's notable, have they? Yeah, well, they've played a couple of teams early on the season. They're one of those teams that bigger bigger Power 5 teams would like to schedule. But I've watched a little bit of their play, so I'm going to dive into that just a bit, saving some room for you guys to kind of fill in the gaps. But let's start with their record. They were 21-10 and 10 on the season, 11-4. and four in the Big West, and to get to the NCAA tournament, they won the Big West tournament, beating UC Davis, Hawaii, and Long Beach State in the process. I did watch that Long Beach State game, and it was not indicative of how they normally play because uh, the one like outlier that they had was that they only had 18 rebounds. That's not much. I can probably pull 18 rebounds on any basketball court on a, in a given day, but as a team, having 18 rebounds is a problem for them. They're going to have to step that up in the NCAA tournament when they normally average closer to 34 rebounds a game. So they can rebound and they have a couple of guys that can do that. But in the big West tournament, they weren't doing a lot of it probably because of one big key factor. They were turning the ball over quite a bit and there weren't a lot of shots being taken on either side. But I think with some of the teams that they did play, I mentioned some of the the bigger teams they played Santa Clara. They lost Wyoming. They lost San Diego state. They lost. After that, 
there was no team in the top 100, according to Ken Palm, that they played this season. They even played two teams that were not in Division I, Life Pacific and Redlands. Of course, they did win those games. Most of their damage came in the Big West Conference. For those of you out there who don't know what the Big West Conference is, Hawaii's in it, UC Irvine, UC San Diego, Cal State Bakersfield, UC, uh, UC Davis, those type of teams, UC Riverside, Long Beach State. So we're talking about that, t- that type of conference. Not a lot of travel for them. They are going to have to leave Southern California and fly all the way across the country to Greenville, South Carolina. This will be the furthest they have traveled all year to play a basketball game, and they're going to have to do it against the number two seed in Duke Blue, Blue Devil. So this is a brief, brief microcosm about Cal State, and I will fill in, Jason, on some of the other things that you guys discussed with the advanced metrics and the players. Yeah, uh, to, to put a fine point on what you were saying about who they've played, they haven't played a team in the top 120 in Ken Palm. Haven't played a top 120 team since December 8th. So clearly biting off a team like Duke that is right around the top 10 is, is just a different caliber of opponent than they've faced this year. Let me get into the advanced stats. So um, on offense, uh, Ken Palm says they are 144th. They play at a slow tempo. One of the bottom 100 slowest teams in Division I. I don't think that'll be a huge issue for Duke because the ACC this year had a lot of teams that played slowly. So Duke is used to teams that like to work the clock, uh, you know, until they find their shot. Uh, in terms of what they do well, Cal State Fullerton, they're a good free throw shooting team. They hit 76% of their free throws and they do a nice job of getting to the line. They're 48th in the country at free throw attempts in relationship to field goal attempts. But that's the only thing they do that's like in the top 100. They're just an average three-point shooting team, only hit about 33%, a third of their threes. They actually don't shoot very many threes. They're one of the you know, lower teams in the country in terms of the number of three-pointers they attempt. They're not really good at getting assists. They mostly try and create baskets on their own. 302nd in the country at assist rate. And they're, you know, they're just an average team at turnovers. They're neither good nor bad. A lot of things about them are just kind of average. And by the way, you should understand, average doesn't mean like average for the ACC. I mean, average for the whole country. Like they're in the, they're around 150 to 170 in a lot of these different categories. Um, On defense, this is a team that is terrible at three-point defense. Their opponents hit better than 37% of their threes. That is a real problem for them. And if Duke goes off from three, forget about it. This game is, is going to be over. Um, they're all right. They're decent at getting turnovers. Cal State Fullerton, you know, is top 75 in the country at, at um, turnover percentage. They don't foul a lot, which is good. They don't send their opponents to the free throw line all that often. They're just, you know, again, an average rebounding team, about 150th in offensive rebounding, 175th in defensive rebounding. And um, they are a smaller team. They don't have a lot of big guys, and they're just not going to block shots at all. Sam, tell me about who they have on their team, because I think it's a lot of guys who are very experienced, fifth-year players who've played a lot of different places before landing at Fullerton, right? Yeah, the, the three guys that really stand out to me for Fullerton, uh, the first is EJ Anasicki. He is a, I guess he's like a super senior at this point. Um, you'll notice that a couple of these guys have also bounced around a little bit. Anasicki started his career at Sacred Heart, and then he was at Tennessee last season, and this year he is at Fullerton. He didn't and by really the way, play. When, when he was at Tennessee, I was going to say, he didn't play at all. For yeah, the, uh, so he didn't, he didn't really play at, at, at Tennessee much, um, but he did get, did get a shot to at least be um, in a program. Like Tennessee's been, been pretty good the last couple of years, uh, very good this year, of course but at least he's had that, ex- that exposure, right? This is not, um, it's not like the team is being led by a bunch of guys who only know the big West conference. Um, so he's, he's, he's been through the ringer with the sec, even if he was mostly a practice player. Um, Anna Siki is, is really effective on the boards. He's, he's uh, well ranked nationally in both offensive and defensive rebounding percentage, averaging like eight rebounds a game. So um, that's a guy to, to be looking out for on the boards. He's only six, seven, but he can really punch above his weight in terms of, of pulling down rebounds. He's also a very efficient shooter, um, sort of similar to Mark Williams, where most of Anasiki shots are going to come within three or four feet. You look at his uh, shot chart from the last few games. He did take, he took and, and made one, three, uh, in, in the big West semifinal game, but generally speaking, he's getting all of his points in the paint. So he's kind of the, the focal point of the offense. Everything's geared around trying to get him the ball inside or allowing him to drive a little bit. That's going to be the the focus for Duke. I'm going to be interested to see how much Anasiki 
uh, like who's who's guarding him. I think it's Paulo Bancaro, but given how much time he spends expressly in the post, um, some of that could be Mark Williams. Another guy who's interesting to me is Damari Milstead. Um, again, another dude who's who's transferred a couple times. He started his career at Grand Canyon um, and then was at San Francisco for a year. So both of those are you know not not like top tier uh, programs, but, but both very competitive teams. San Francisco um, was good this year. They almost made the tournament. So again, a guy who has experience playing in, in, in uh, at, at real programs and, and is, has had a pretty good season um, here for, for Fullerton. Milstead is the, is the point guard. Uh, Jason, you mentioned that it's not like these guys are, you know, overwhelming you with, with assists or anything, um, but he's been, he's been pretty effective um, sort of uh, across the board for for Fullerton this year. He's a six two point guard, um, not exactly big. Of course, this is going to be the the story for all of these guys, right? Um, when Duke is going up against a mid major program, one of the things that they're always going to have is the size advantage. Duke has the size advantage even against most teams that they play in the ACC. So that's going to be the part that I hope is is like the overwhelming thing for here. I'll pause here because because I think that those are kind of the two highlight guys. There's one more that I wanted to come back to, but Jason, curious if you had um had advanced stats you wanted to jump in with about um about any of that. No, no. I mean the major thing that I noted like you said was that these guys are very very experienced and that this is a team that um uh you know has a lot of guys that have bounced around a lot and and are playing in their fourth and fifth year and Look, we saw against Virginia Tech, I, I think uh, we, we spoke extensively on the last podcast about experience and age and things like that. And uh, Duke is getting a team in Cal State Fullerton that is very experienced and, and has a lot of guys who are like going to be 22, 23, even 24 years old. For me, there's a couple other things that stand out from the advanced metrics versus how they basically got to the tournament through the Big West Conference Tournament. One thing, Jason, you mentioned that they're an average three-point shooting team. But, of course, mid-majors, when they pull off upsets in the NCAA tournament, it's because they get hot from beyond the arc. And they were hot beyond the arc, especially against Long Beach State. They only won that game by one point, the title game. But they were 11 for 20 from three on that game. They had a lot of guys who were able to fill it up. And if they get hot, that is how mid-majors will beat and make upsteps in the NCAA tournament. So our perimeter defense has got to be on point. The other thing is on when they're on defense – Teams love to move the ball around on them. Their assists to field goals made, uh, teams that play them assists on 54% of all made baskets. So for Duke, a similar play game plan of moving the ball around to what we've been doing against Syracuse this year, they're not going to do a 2-3 zone of any kind, but they're going to have opportunities where guys will be able to have open threes and will be able to move the ball around to get open looks either at the three-point line or in the paint. So I think Duke really needs to focus on that. It's something that, again, it's a metric that we've been following all season. When we do that very well, we are normally very successful. This will be a game that we can make sure that happens. We'll take Fulton out of the game very quickly. Coming back to experience, Jason, um, and, and just highlighting a couple other guys in their program. Vincent Lee is the other big man on this team who gets a who gets a good chunk of minutes. Um, also a very good rebounder next to Anasiki. So that's going to be uh, in, sort of interesting to watch. Lee, again, he's only 6'8". So... So maybe Anasiki is being guarded by Paulo and, and Vincent Lee is being guarded by, by Mark Williams. Both of them are giving up size in, in that um, matchup. Uh, the other guy that is, is probably one of their, um, their better scorers is Jalen Harris, who uh, is, again, also a senior. Lee is a junior. So Jason, you already highlighted that experience is a, is a huge boon for Fullerton here. Um, Harris is a senior. Again, not very big, 6'1", 180 guy but a guy who who is a pretty efficient scorer and is a bit of a pest on defense so i think that's going to be the the main thing that duke is contending with is the experience and look no further than duke's most recent game against virginia tech where the experience and the poise seem to to win out uh, against the talent exactly look ken pomeroy says duke wins this game 79 to 65 a 14 point margin I think the uh, I think the bookies I think the betting line is a little bit more than that more like closer to seventeen maybe even eighteen points. Um, uh, yeah, but that's Duke. the but that's the Duke that's the Duke premium exactly. or, the, or the Duke discount depending on the way you look at that. At right, that line. exactly. Um, uh, it is worth noting. Um, it, it never overlook any opponent. I, I mean, it, it's absolutely Ken Pomeroy. Even though he predicts Duke winning by fourteen, he says there's a ten percent chance that Cal State Fullerton wins this game. It's not outside the realm of possibility. Like Donald said, that they get hot from three. That Duke is, you know, just in a bit of a funk. I mean, we've we've seemed like we've been in a funk for 
going on 10 days now, and uh, it, it could happen. Uh, there's uh, even a 215 matchup. There's no sure things in the NCAA tournament when it's, when it's all said and done. But I, I want to take the risk <laughs> of looking ahead a little bit. Guys, the sort of the, the teams in Duke's way, let's look a little bit at the West bracket now, just a, a, a bit. And I don't want to go too much in depth on this, but should Duke beat Cal State? Because, by the way, because if Duke beats Cal State Fullerton, we'll have a preview of who we play next, you know, coming up later this week. But um, uh, the next team for Duke will, you know, presumably, assuming we win, would be the winner of the Davidson and Michigan State game. And um, we, we can talk about that game really quickly. I want to note one thing. I'm going to go on the record right now and tell you that I think Davidson's going to win that game. Um, I think that they were a little bit underseeded. Uh, I think Davidson's a, a really good club. And um, I think they're better than Michigan State. Michigan State struggled all year. And there's an, a fascinating little side story to all of this, which is that the point guard for Davidson is Foster Lawyer. Do you guys remember Foster Lawyer? He played yep, Michigan he's the State one that got, He's the one that got his ankles just destroyed by, uh, by a Jones. By Trey Jones. Yes, Trey Jones broke his ankle, stepped on him, made the, the basket, and Foster Lawyer was still called for the foul. It's one of the most disrespectful uh, fouls in the history of, of college basketball. A legendary play. But Foster Lawyer, of course, played at Michigan State when that play happened. He, ha he sort of struggled a bit at Michigan State. He's now transferred to Davidson and really blossomed nicely for them. Um, and Davidson's one of these teams... They're full of guys who bomb from three. They've got an Australian and a guy from Korea who, who shoot tons of three-pointers. They've got a big man from New Zealand. They've got another big man from England. They're a super experienced team. I think... Wait, how do they find so many players from overseas? I what, don't know. Ask what is, Bob what is Yeah, I was going to say, what's McKillop's budget for that? <laughs> it's crazy, but they have... Davidson is just full of international guys. I will hey, say... Charlotte is an international hub for, for American Airlines. He can go... What He can go you know, nonstop to like 70 countries. Like that man can travel very, very easily. But, uh, but I think it's just a, a really interesting, I'm kind of hoping rather than Michigan state again, that Duke gets Davidson, a team that they used to play all the time, but we haven't played them much lately. Um, and, uh, and, and by the way, Duke, Duke may have some Intel. We may have a little bit of inside info if we play Davidson because Bates Jones could have been on that Davidson team. Instead, he transferred to Duke and, uh, Hopefully he'll be able to give give us, you know, if it's Davidson, I hope he gives us a little little intel. I, I think when it comes to that matchup, it's interesting, right? Because you know the storylines were there. And even like throughout the whole season when they were kind of sliding around like bracketology, all these different uh, services doing bracketology, they always had that, you know, when Duke was either on the one line or the or the or the two line, they always had that seven ten matchup being Michigan State right there. So that storyline is out ever present. Tom Izzo versus Coach K. Uh, I, I know a bunch of Sparty fans who are already talking trash. I say, hey, focus on your game first, then we can talk. Uh, just like we're going to do the same. But I, I think when it comes to that matchup, uh, Sam alluded to it yesterday when we we uh, you know did the selection show episode. In the fact that Davidson is a hop, skip, and a jump away from Greenville, South Carolina, they will have fans there at this game. That will be an ever-present, you know, X factor for them. Because again, mid majors can get hot. This team shoots well from three, and they do it consistently. So the fact that they will have a bunch of fans on their side, and they have that momentum that mid majors love to have in the NCAA tournament, Sparty could have a hell of a time with Davidson. But I will say this. I'm not counting Sparty out of that game because the Michigan State Spartans are always a tough team. Tom Izzo is never going to make, make it an easy out for any team. And that team plays physical, something that Davison has not seen much this year either. So that'll be an intriguing matchup. And I think Duke will have their hands full with either team if they get through. Hey, Sam, take us a little bit further up the draw. <laughs> Again, we're not getting ahead of ourselves, but you can't help but look at who's coming next. That's the glory of the bracket. Talk to me a little bit about Texas Tech. Yeah, Texas Tech, to me, they're, they're the three seed in this bracket. They are technically ranked ahead of Duke in Ken Palm. And Texas Tech, if you, if you want to ask me which team I'm most scared of in this bracket, Duke's already beaten Gonzaga this year. And not that, not that I think that, oh, because you beat Gonzaga once, you're going to be able to beat him again. Far from it. Gonzaga has been the best team in the country this season, you know, with, with only a couple losses uh, on their resume. Texas Tech is awesome, though. Um, yeah, I'm, been, I'm terrified of those guys. I'll, I'll freely admit it. <laughs> they're, uh, they've been one of the best teams in the Big 12, which is arguably um, 
arguably like one of the, maybe the best conference in, in the country, along with the big 10 and the sec. Uh, they lost to Kansas in the big 12 championship game, but the game is in Kansas city. So, you know, what can you, what can you do about that? Um, you got to really admire and, and Texas tech, uh, also features um, a guy who who was uh, prominent in last year's tournament. That was Kevin O'Banner from uh, from Oral Roberts. He's a transfer there, so that was pretty cool. Um, but Texas Tech is experienced. They're big, and they can compete with anybody. So you know, as scared as I think anyone should be of of uh, Gonzaga, as as good as they are, I think Texas Tech is awesome. The other team in this in this bracket um, that's intriguing to me and Duke will only get one of Texas tech or them is Alabama. Um, they've had a very up and down season, but if you remember, there was that uh, entirely stupid uh, controversy from last year with the, uh, with the Alabama coach. So if nothing else, it would be great to have Duke play them just to, you know, just to, just to, to close the door on that stupidity um, elsewhere in the, in the bracket. I, I I'd love to talk about kind of what's, what's in the top half of that region, even though, Duke let's, won't necessarily yeah, see all those teams, but let's yeah, wait guys, a second on else? that. Wait a second <laughs> on that. Donald, you want to say something about Alabama? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, Alabama does have some quality wins. Remember they also beat Gonzaga. Uh, I believe that was at a neutral site early in the yep. season, but and by the way, uh, Texas the, tech, Texas tech has played Gonzaga and lost to them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, but here's the thing about Alabama. I, if I'm an Alabama fan, I hate the matchup that they have because if you guys know, they have the winner of Rutgers and Notre Dame in the with two of the teams in the first four. A team from the first four has gone on to win a game in every single tournament that this has existed except for 2019. And last year, UCLA took that and rode it all the way to the final four. Syracuse has done the same. And I believe, check me on this, I believe George Mason even got to like a Sweet 16 or Elite Eight doing the same thing. So they are going to be in trouble because whoever is going to win that game between Rutgers and Notre Dame will always have the momentum over a team that is cold and has not played in the NCAA tournament yet. Alabama could fall to one of those teams. They're going to have to be very careful if they want to advance. The way Alabama shoots threes, and I don't mean like their percentage, I mean their volume of threes, they can shoot anyone out of the gym or shoot themselves out of the gym against anyone. So they are a true wild card. Roll the dice. Alabama could beat anybody and could lose to anybody in this tournament. I want to get back really quick. Sam, you mentioned about something about Texas Tech. There may not be a team in the country that has as many impressive wins as Texas Tech does. They beat, you're right, they lost to Kansas in the Big 12 final, but during the regular season, they beat Kansas. They beat Baylor twice. They beat Tennessee. And man, that Texas Tech team, Texas Tech team, super experienced. Everyone that they play are juniors or seniors, and most of them are fifth year seniors. It, 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 yeah, I, I want no part of them, but I, I can't see any way that we're not going to be playing them. Um, that, that it's a nightmare for Duke, I think. By the way, Jason, on the story of Texas Tech, uh, they're working with a first year head coach. Remember, their their head coach, yeah. Chris Beard, left uh, the Red Raiders to be the Texas coach this season. So they're doing, I, and, and at some point, maybe we'll get to talk about Arizona, who's also doing, you know, having an amazing season with a first year head coach. But Texas Tech is doing this um, in, in really incredible circumstances. Uh, so Sam, you alluded to it earlier. Let's talk about the top half of the of the draw just a little bit. Um, uh, I think the West is an absolute minefield. Minefield. The the West is, uh, in my opinion, far and away the toughest bracket. And that's not just because Duke is there. I, I actually think that even though I think Duke is, it's certainly the worst or, or at least you know the least impressive of the two seeds. Gonzaga got no favors. They're going to get. They're probably going to get a Boise State team in the round of 32 that is really good. Boise state had some head scratching losses in November, but they've been outstanding since that they, they have clearly been a top 25 team since, you know, like November, December, Boise state is really good. And don't, don't underestimate Jason, the regional rivalry involved in Gonzaga playing Boise state. Um, I know that most folks who yeah. listen to this show are probably not from that part of the country, but those two schools are not that far from each other. Yeah. And by the way, if they don't get Boise state, they get Memphis. Memphis, super inconsistent, but unbelievably athletic, full of guys who are going to be playing in the NBA, who are they, full of lottery picks. I mean, that's that Memphis team. So no favors there for Gonzaga. And after that, they're probably going to get an Arkansas team that I checked this since mid-January. They had a, Arkansas had a little swoon early in January. Since mid-January, Arkansas has been a top 10 team in the country, according to Bart Torvik. So Gonzaga is looking at Boise State or Memphis, then Arkansas, then Duke or Texas Tech. Is this the moment where oh. I tell you guys about about some of the upsets? I, maybe we can sprinkle these in here. <laughs> uh, 
one of my one of my favorite things to look at as I'm preparing my bracket is uh, the the geographical implications of of where everybody's playing all of these games. Uh, the that pod of Yukon and Arkansas, they're playing their first round games in Buffalo. Uh, UConn is playing New Mexico State and Vermont is playing Arkansas. I am going uh, local fans being being the difference there. So I actually have uh, Arkansas going out in the first round to Vermont because UVM, uh, if you're you know in the Northeast, they'll bring the fans. I mean, that's, this is the first you know post COVID you know NCAA tournament that's going to be full of fans at every single stop that we've had in what three years now. So. That's going to be a big factor for some of these teams. Even if they've been in, in the last couple of NCAA tournaments, they've been doing it without fans. So this is going to be a big deal for them. I don't want to underrate, though, the effect that Arkansas fans can have because I know that Arkansas fans love they their travel. basketball program. Yeah, they, they, and they haven't they love been good travel. in a long time. So uh, I, like low-key, Buffalo might be one of the best first-round locations because uh, you've got UVM is nearby, Connecticut's nearby, and Arkansas brings the heat, I think, when, when they go on the road. So that one could be, could be a ton of fun. So, Jason, you just talked about how strong the West region is. And I want to go through some of, it, some of the metrics that they have. As you, as you two know, and as everyone out there knows, they released the seedings, 1 through 68, who, how they seeded so you know who ended up being slotted where and, and where they were in the, in the big field. So I just want to go through the Western Conference. Take into account... I agree with everything that Jason said about how strong this, this bracket is for the West. So let me go through the, the actual seedings. Gonzaga, obviously the overall number one seed. They're playing 16th Georgia State, the strongest 16th seed in the field. Boise State, strongest eight seed. Memphis, the lowest nine seed. UConn, the strongest five. New Mexico State, the second lowest 12. Arkansas, the lowest four. Vermont, the second lowest 13. Alabama, the strongest six. Rutgers, Notre Dame, because they're in the playing game, they're the lowest 11. Texas Tech, lowest, thir- lowest three. Montana State, the lowest 14. Michigan State, the second lowest seven. Davidson, the lowest 10. Duke, the lowest two seed. And Cal State Fullerton, the lowest 15 seed. That just tells you one thing. There is a lot of parity in college basketball this year. There are a lot of good teams, not great teams. All these teams we talked about have been great at several different points of the season. And a lot of them I listed as some of the lowest amongst the seeds that they are in. That is a big problem for the West because this people look in the West and saying it's a very weak field. Oh no, no, this is a very loaded field and anyone can pick off anybody on any given day. All right, guys, um, we're going to try and dive back into Duke now before we take a commercial break. And I asked you all, you had an assignment. I want to know one key. What is one thing you're looking for? What is the one thing that you need to see from Duke? It can be a personnel thing, can be a style thing, whatever it may be. And don't say, oh, we got to hit 100% of our threes. <laughs> That'd be too easy. Oh, we do. Yeah, That'd be great. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's my one key. Duke hits 100% of their three-pointers. They're cutting down the nets. Okay, we're done. Out of here. <laughs> uh, no, in all seriousness, though, I, I want to know what's your one key. What's the one thing you're looking for from Duke uh, in this tournament to have a long, successful run? Sam, I'll come to you first on this. I don't normally take too much stock in what the players and coaches say in the post-game press conferences. It's fun to for us to attend them and to ask questions, and sometimes you get little nuggets that can be sort of interesting bulletin board material, but we just spent the first few minutes of this show talking about how experienced Cal State Fullerton is, and if there's one thing that Duke has struggled with this season, it's playing teams that are experienced. The teams that have beaten Duke are experienced teams. I am looking in the post-game press conference after Duke hopefully beats Cal State Fullerton by 10 or 12 or 15 points. I am looking for what guys like Wendell Moore say in that post-game press conference about how they've learned from the games, the recent games, either losses or, or tough wins against UNC, Virginia Tech, Miami, Syracuse. What have they learned from those experiences that they took forward to the Cal State Fullerton game? Because the experience only ratchets up from there and the, and the talent ratchets up from there. If Duke beats Fullerton, we said they're either getting a Davidson team that, that's got a home game or a Michigan State team that we know always brings poise. If they win that that weekend, they get to likely play Texas Tech, who we said has a ton of experience. If they beat all of those teams, they probably have to play Gonzaga, the best team in the country, who do have a ton of experience. So um, I am looking for Duke to react maturely and and confidently to that first game against Fullerton. I love it. That's a great answer. Donald, your turn. What's your one factor? What's your one key? 
So for me, it's there's two things really, and it's two two things I think kind of go hand in hand, and they've been the most visibly absent for us this month, and that's defense and leadership. Those are the things that I think we've done well at various times of the year, defense especially. We've been one of the top defensive teams in the country, and if we can improve that defense, it's also something that we can improve quickly, right? We can get back to those basics that we were doing in late January and throughout the month of February where we were just terrorizing teams on the defensive end of the floor. So I think if we can improve on those two things, defense and leadership, those are the two quickest things to fix. And I think those are the two things that'll make the biggest difference because they say defense wins championships. I said it yesterday and I'll say it again. I think leadership does. And if we can have both of those go hand in hand, I think we'll be all right. I feel like you guys, the two things you're talking about there are are very, very similar. Um, And I don't disagree with any of it. I mean, God, we have focused on leadership and experience so much lately. My key, my factor, it's going to be something easy to see, easy to notice. I want to see how much Mark Williams is on the floor and how effective he is because the, the, the teams that Duke's likely to be playing at least early in this tournament are not teams that are super big. And I, earlier this year, coach K would take Mark Williams out against teams that are bigger. And I think it hurts Duke's defense. When we do that, our defense is the key to this team advancing and having Mark Williams on the floor and playing well is the, the, uh, there's a reason the dude was named ACC Defensive Player of the Year. And Mark Williams cannot be played off the floor by a small mobile team in the NCAA tournament. I love the fact against Miami, when Duke played Miami, which is a small mobile team, that Coach K didn't abandon Mark Williams and that Mark Williams got plenty of minutes against them. Now, against Virginia Tech, he didn't play a lot <clears throat> because he was in a lot of foul trouble. But um, I, I just I, I feel like if Duke goes small with Paulo Bancaro as, as our biggest guy on the floor, it's a real problem because Paulo's he, he's not a rim protector and he's not a great like primary rebounder. He, he does fine rebounding when he's not the main rebounder. I just feel like we got to get Mark Williams on the floor a lot. And I, I want to note for it for the record, Cal state Fullerton has no one over six, eight and several of their bigger players are perfectly comfortable stepping outside and shooting threes. Um, Davidson Davidson center hits 40% of his threes and, and had, shoots almost three three-pointers per game. Michigan State's Marcus Bingham, who's their big man, um, hits better than 40% of his three-pointers and, and is comfortable stepping outside. Duke cannot let Mark Williams be played off the floor or we will not last in this tournament. And then the other thing is, and this kind of goes with it, is we, we just can't let these other teams hit a ton of their three-pointers. And believe it or not, I think Mark Williams is part of a key in that because when Mark is on the floor, I think we're we're more comfortable stepping out and stepping up on three point shooters because we know we've got Mark behind us protecting the rim. So my big key, and it ripples through all of our defensive effort is Mark Williams being a force in the middle for Duke, especially on the defensive end of the floor. All right. So with that, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to look at the rest of the bracket a little bit and you know it, you want it. You can't wait to hear it. Final four picks from Donald, Sam and Jason coming up. All right, we're back from the break. We're done talking about the West. No more with Duke's bracket. But there are some other brackets out there. And uh, we got to talk about them a little bit. And we got to talk about the ACC teams. Um, I'm just going to recount for you very quickly. Here's where the ACC is in the field. Duke, of course, is the number two seed in the West. Again, done talking about that. Uh, We kind of mentioned that Notre Dame is also in the West. They play Rutgers in the play-in game. Then they have Alabama, then Texas Tech. Uh, You know, unless one of you guys really wants to talk about Notre Dame, I think we kind of covered the West a bit. Uh, UNC is number eight in the East. They get Marquette. If they win that game, they almost certainly will get Baylor. Uh, I think it could be a short trip to the NCAA tournament for, for UNC. Uh, Miami is number 10 in the Midwest. They've got a USC team that I think they can beat. And then an Auburn team. That'll be a really interesting matchup. Um, and then Virginia tech is number 11 in the East. Um, uh, you know, I, I get why they're an 11, 11 seed, but man, I think that Virginia Tech team could really make some waves, and that's not just because they just beat Duke the other day. The advanced metrics say that Virginia Tech is way, way, way better than an 11 seed. They will play Texas in the first round and then probably Purdue. I'm sure Texas and Purdue are not happy to see Virginia Tech in their bracket. 
Um, guys, anything on the ACC teams uh, as they spread across the country? Donald. Yeah, I, I think for me, the intriguing matchup for me is UNC versus Marquette. Marquette has been a team that has been struggling a little bit this year, but they also have some pretty good wins and they play tough. Uh, you know, Shaka Smart is, is, a, is one of those guys that when you get to the NCAA tournament, you never want to count him out either. So uh, UNC, if they don't bring their A game, Marquette could send them home in the first round. Uh, but also, as we've, as we've noted at many times this season, UNC has the talent to go very far in this tournament. But uh, again, I think you're, you're, you're right in saying that even if they get past Marquette, they have a very difficult draw in trying to top the Baylor Bears, the defending national champions, uh, and very close to home. They'll be in Fort Worth for those games. So uh, I think that is going to be the most intriguing one for me. But like you, I, I'll, I'll go to Virginia Tech quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to pick them uh what they're going to do because they're so hot right now they might be the hottest team in the country i think they've won what 15 out of their last 16 games or something like that Uh, but when it comes to them they they have a difficult draw too i think they can get past texas i think they can beat purdue but purdue at one point for for very large portion of the season was ranked in top three in the country so that is a team that probably should not be a three seed right now but i it's going to be interesting to see what happens with virginia tech against those two teams yeah, the, the bummer for me looking at this bracket is that other than Duke, it's entirely possible that the ACC is possible and, and even probable that the ACC is otherwise knocked out of the tournament by the end of the first weekend. I like UNC's draw kind of the most, given that I think that they're playing one of the weaker first round opponents among ACC teams. But man, it, it's going to be a I think it's going to be a gauntlet for everybody. Um, Notre Dame, a lot of the conversation last night was that Notre Dame probably didn't even deserve to be in this field, uh, even though we know that that they are that they are a capable team. So I think they're going to lose. I think they'll lose to Rutgers. Yeah. So so we we've I mean, we've look, we've kind of seen this coming, right? We knew that the ACC didn't have the the guys here. Virginia Tech is the other one that that's sort of intriguing to me, given that Look, they are by um, by definition they are hot right now. They just came off a, an ACC championship. Uh, they beat Duke. Like Duke is one of the best teams in the country, right? Even even with the the sort of lackluster last week and a half, and Virginia Tech just beat the pants off of Duke um, just a few days ago. So I would think that if you're playing Virginia Tech early in this tournament, that you have to be scared. So I kind of like them just on the momentum that they've had. Uh, from the end of the season, so I, I'd be I'd be nervous about playing them. Uh, really, it's it's really a tough um, a tough ask when you uh, are a six seed and and have to face an eleven seed who was also the ACC champion. Hey, hey Donald, I'll, I'll I'll put this to you first. Let's uh, let's just spreading out on the bracket. Just give me one or two other regions or teams or whatever that you're looking at that you go, oh, that's kind of interesting or intriguing or whatever else it may be. So. Outside the ACC, I, I'm just going to say this. I, I mentioned that there's a lot of good teams, no great or elite teams. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of potential for 12-5, 11-6, and even maybe a 13-4 upset. Because some of these teams are, again, are very high. And some teams, you just don't know what team you're going to get entering the NCAA tournament. But I will say this about a particular conference. That conference is the Big Ten. Last year, the Big Ten had nine teams in the NCAA tournament. And only one of them made it out of the first weekend. That was the one seed Michigan who made it to the elite eight and then lost a nail biter to UCLA, who I mentioned was in the first four and made it all the way to the final four. And really, again, was a buzzer beater away from the title game. The big 10 has nine teams again this year. You would think that some of these teams would advance further. They do have some stronger teams, but I, if I'm remembering correctly, there's no team in the big 10 that's rated higher than a three seed. So I'm very wary of the conference's overall success. So when you're looking at these teams, you say, oh, the Big Ten must be one of the strongest team or conferences because they have nine teams in this tournament. Don't bet too heavily on the Big Ten to have a bunch of teams go far because some of them will get caught up. And as we've mentioned through some of the ACC matchups, some of these teams are in some precarious situations and they may not last the weekend. So, you know, caveat enter when it comes to the Big Ten because again, while they have nine teams, some of these teams are not going to make it out of weekend one. I told you, in the first half of the show about my preference for picking teams that have uh, better geographical situations. One team from the big 10, Donald, that you were just talking about one team from the big 10 that is overseeded, I think, according to the advanced metrics, but that got a great road for themselves is Wisconsin. They get to play their first round games in Milwaukee, which 
Milwaukee is the largest city in Wisconsin. So that that pod is going to be full of Wisconsin fans. And then if they make it through Milwaukee, they have to go all the way to Chicago for their for their Sweet 16 and Elite Eight games. So like um, an that, hour and a half from campus or something? Yeah, like, like nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, 90 Milwaukee, minutes from Milwaukee. Yeah. Let me I was going to say, let me let me offend a few people and tell you that Milwaukee is basically a suburb of Chicago. So um, and and Madison, like Madison is farther. I, Madison's like two or three hours from from Milwaukee. I've done that drive before. Uh, it's not very far. And of course, there are a ton of Wisconsin fans in both Milwaukee and Chicago. So uh, Wisconsin is going to have no shortage of fans there. If that Elite Eight game is Wisconsin versus Kansas, in at the United Center, that is going to be one of the best matchups in terms of fan bases showing up because you know there are a ton of Kansas fans that can make it to Chicago and every Wisconsin fan can make it to Chicago. So that one is going to be great if Wisconsin obviously is able to to get through their gauntlet and and they have to beat Auburn on the way. Auburn's the 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 two seed there. The other uh, interesting sort of geographic um, advantage that I that I was looking at in here. Uh, Houston, should they make it through their first weekend, get to go to uh, San Antonio for their Sweet 16 and Elite Eight, where they would presumably, you know, if they make it through, they're not even rated um, in terms of the the bracket seedings. They shouldn't make it to the Sweet 16, but should they make it through there? And I and they're one of the best teams by the metrics. They get to play Arizona in San Antonio. That also, if it was Houston versus Arizona in San Antonio in the Sweet 16, that also is going to be out of control from a fan base perspective. So uh, look out for that matchup as well. You know, you guys picked two of the th- topics that I wanted to talk about with the bracket. First of all, I was saying, I was going to say, I- I'll be watching Houston in the South because they're a five seed that all the computers say is one of the five best teams in the country. Um, so according to the advanced metrics, Houston is horribly underseeded. Um, but they, and they're they good get, too. Watching yeah. them play, they are good. Not like 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 you're some people like yeah, they're good. They are good. They can beat anybody in this tournament. Yeah, and but they get they get a, a round of 32 matchup against Illinois in all probability that I think is going to be a really tough matchup for Houston. And then the other thing you guys talked about a little bit was the Big Ten. I, I actually think Iowa, it may be the most criminally underseeded team in this entire field. They're a five seed. Iowa is. Since February 1st, I, I checked out Bart Torvik. Since February 1st, Iowa's been the second best team in the country. Number two in the entire nation since February 1st, Iowa. And they, they get, they're a five. Their five four matchup, their four five matchup is going to be against a Providence team who's a number four. I think Providence is horribly overseeded. They are not that good. Providence finds a way to win all these close games. I don't think it's going to be close against Iowa. I think Iowa will blow Providence out. I would pencil Iowa into the Sweet 16 as much as maybe any team in this entire draw. Yeah, but Providence is playing at basically at home too. They also draw Buffalo. So Providence is, is they're going to have a ton of fans there too. Let, let's put it this way. Providence is close enough that they may be able to sleep in their own beds. Uh, okay, that's nice. I, I'm telling you, Iowa is just way better than Providence. It's like, it, that, that, is, uh, that, that is one of those games I will put my money down on that one. On the topic of of fan bases that travel and will be there, uh, I said that Kansas versus Wisconsin and Chicago will be good. It's likely Kansas versus Iowa and Chicago for the game before that. So, um, man, the the, yeah. uh, the the Chicago regional like Duke is going to be playing potentially if Duke makes it to the Sweet Sixteen. Duke is potentially playing in the least interesting regional. It's like it's either the West or it's <laughs> the East, but the South and the Midwest are going to be insane if the right programs get there. All right, guys. So speaking of the right programs getting there, time for our final four picks. I want to hear who you got. What's your storyline? What's it going to be? Sam, go first. Who are your final four selections? So I, I this is this is the year where I think I, I a few years ago, I didn't pick Duke to I think it was in 2016 when Duke was a four seed. We all kind of knew going into the tournament. That was the Brandon Ingram year where Duke was good. They were not great. Um, they were a four seed. They lost to Oregon and, and they, they sort of like went out exactly as expected. I didn't pick Duke to win the championship that year. Otherwise I always pick Duke. Duke is a one seed or a two seed or a three seed. These are the teams that you expect to get to the championship. I have to be totally honest here, really strong reservations about picking Duke to win the national championship this year. They've looked really shaky recently. They're missing um, some of the elements that I think are, are so essential to to winning a championship, that being veteran leadership that really steps up at the right time. However, they're a number two seed, and it's Coach K's last season. 
if you don't think, if you don't think in, in you your heart of it. hearts, you gotta do if it. you don't think in your heart of hearts as a Duke fan that Coach K can't figure out in these last few weeks of his career how to motivate this team to get to a national championship, then what have you been watching for the last 42 years? Duke is going to win the national championship. I'm telling you that now. Um, let me tell you about the rest of my final four here. In case, in case you think that this, nat- that this final four is going to be devoid of storylines other than Coach K winning the national championship. Kentucky is going to beat Baylor in, in the Elite Eight in the East region, which I said that there are going to be uh, potentially the East and the West are going to be the boring regions. Kentucky playing Baylor is like a great game for college basketball. Like you, you, you can't argue with that, but that being the game that ends up in Philly is like such a bummer for all of the other, pro- I know, like I know. Duke could have ended up there. Villanova could have ended up there, but um, Kentucky is going to beat Baylor in the elite eight and then lose to Duke in the final four. And in case that's not enough storyline for you, Kansas is going to beat Tennessee in the other, um, in the other final four matchup. Duke is going to beat Kansas in a reprise of its first national championship victory from 1991. So I've got Duke over Kansas in the 2022 national championship game. Oh my God, Sam, you literally have the exact same final four, the exact same storyline, everything the same as me. I am. I'm, I, I agree with you completely. That's fine. You know, you know, okay, fine. You, you, literally should, down to should, ten. Wait, including should Tennessee, one of us I, switch. If you want to switch, go ahead. I am. I am confident Duke over Kentucky, Kansas over Tennessee, Duke over Kansas in a repeat of Coach K's first national title. Should we switch it up? Should we switch it up and have Arizona uh, beating, uh, coming out of that region so that Duke can beat Arizona in the national championship to repeat 2001 instead of 1991? Dude, you switch anything you want. I mean, whatever you I'm going, you I've want. got mine. It's locked in. Donald, your turn. Okay, so I, I, I have reservations like Sam does. Uh, about Duke making the final four and winning this whole thing. But uh, as you all know, uh, since I have started doing picks, I have only picked two teams to ever win the national championship. That would be Duke and Michigan. And this year I'm still picking Duke. You know why? Because F it. That's why we're going to go all the way, baby. Let's do it. So Wait, we are, here's the, by the thing, way, though. We, we are the Duke basketball report. <laughs> we are the Duke basketball kind of report podcast. Incumbent it's, on it's, us. Come on now. Do you want, no, I mean, but do you here's want me the to thing, pick, Do you want me to pick this as if I'm not a Duke fan? Because I can tell you what I what what my brain fully tells wait, me wait, is going wait, to happen wait. here. No, I, I don't think I want no. to. I don't want to hear no. it. So, <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is the this is where I'm going to differ a little bit from you guys. There is a huge storyline out there that ain't going to happen because in this storybook ride, Coach K's last ride, nothing has gone to plan. Right? We've had a lot of things that have slowed up this storybook ending. And the one thing that would make this storybook ending a storybook ending would be playing Kentucky in the final four. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not trying to put nothing on nobody's bulletin board, but I just think there's a team out there that's going to be better than them on a given day. That team is going to be UCLA. UCLA is going to be the storyline. We are going to have UCLA in the final four in the semifinal game, because again, we're talking about K we're talking about wooden. We're talking about the goat and we have to get past the goats team to get to the championship game on the other side. As of right now, and I'm still waffling on Tennessee. I do have Tennessee in the in the semifinal losing to Kansas, and I do have a Duke Kansas championship game because I think honestly, when I'm looking at this through Homer eyes, forget the storyline part of it. The fact that Coach K could go out beating the team that he won for his first national championship to claim his sixth national championship on his way out the door. I just think Kansas might be the best one seed and have the best path to new orleans in this bracket that's why i have them in the championship game and that's why i have them losing to duke 79 to 77 oh donald's even got the score down i love it hey, hey guys before we go really quickly wisdom Wait, of the jason crowd. jason yeah. b- before yeah. we before we get to whatever that topic is i was just trying to look this up while donald was was giving his vision of the future maybe you guys remember this while i'm trying to scan through the wikipedia pages yeah if duke beats ucla in the final four which of duke's very early final fours are they avenging um, cause I know that we lost to UCLA at least once in like the sixties. It was, um, I, I can, I can keep looking this up. It was like uh, 1964 or something like that. 66. Yeah. Wow. Um, I mean, that's, that's 66. Old time. No, 66 was UTEP. 
Um, and you, it, we lost to no, sorry, uh, what is it? We, we lost, lost to Kentucky. Well, we um, lost to Kentucky, we, and then Kentucky lost to UTEP in the in the. the yep. First we lost. Yeah. All right, I I I do have the the page up. Duke lost to UCLA. I should say Texas Western. They were Texas. Right. Yes, they were Texas yeah. Western. Duke lost to UCLA in the 1964 national championship. So if Donald is right, revenge. <laughs> we are going to get the Bruins back for 64. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, going way back before my literally this one's, before my time. Before this one's for born. Coach Bubis. <laughs> All right. So wait. So I was going to ask you guys wisdom of the crowd. I looked on ESPN. They have the national title picks. Uh, you know the percentage of people who've picked every team to win the national title. Uh, you know, based on everybody picking in their pool so far. I'm sure you guys can guess who the top pick is. It is Gonzaga. At 29.6% 29. of the brackets on ESPN are picking Gonzaga to win the national title. Y'all want to guess who's second? Who do you think is second? I would guess Kansas. Arizona from that. It, it, it is. It is Arizona uh, at 12.2%. And then, Donald, you said Kansas at 8.3%. Who do you think is the fourth most popular pick on ESPN to win the national title? Duke Ayler. <laughs> Donald is correct. It is the Duke Blue Devils at 6.8%. And then... Kentucky at 6.6, then Baylor at 5.2, and then on and on and on. Uh, I anyway, be, I just uh, thought it was interesting that I, the wisdom of the crowd has picked Duke as the fourth most likely team to win the national title. I think it's very interesting that all three of us are really discounting Baylor's chances of, of making it out of the East region. Like, Baylor is awesome. Um, and they play in a tough conference, and they were very good this year, right? So uh, Yeah, and, and they had some injuries that they've now come back from, to, and they're even better. And to the extent that so they have I, experience that they bring forward into this tournament, they were national champions last year. So I have them losing, I want to say, in the Sweet 16 to UCLA. Here's the reason why. The last time, and, and again, people can check me later on this fat check, uh, I believe the last time that Baylor had a road to the Final Four that included them not leaving the state of Texas was 2015. A pretty good team went down to Texas and beat them in that in the Elite Eight. I believe that team yeah, was who, Duke University. Donald, who was that? Yeah. Yeah, it was Duke University. So that's why I don't think they, they're not leaving the state of Texas at all. <laughs> By the way, okay, so last last thing I have, we've been talking about fan bases. You know, Sam's talked a lot about fans that travel and different fan bases, things like that. I want to give a shout out. A shout out to the Georgia State fans because on ESPN's ranking of, you know, teams that were picked to win the national title, Georgia State is a 16 seed. Georgia State is the 30th most popular pick of every team in this bracket to win the national title. That is Georgia State fans going out there, filling out their ESPN bracket and saying, hell yeah, I'm picking my team to go all the way, even though they are a 16 seed. They are the 30th most popular pick in everyone of every team, all 68 teams in the field. Georgia State, the 30th best team in terms of chances of winning the title, according to the wisdom of the crowd. So hat tip to those Georgia State fans. And, and that's smart play. If you're in pools and stuff like that, and everybody's picking the Dukes and the Kansases and the and Gonzagas of the world, you pick the Loyola Chicago's, you pick the Georgia States, you pick those teams. Cause if, if it gets far enough, you're going to be that person that ESPN or CBS interviews as the, like the top bracket in America, the only one who has a perfect final four, because you went for your team. That's how you got to do it. Go, go for your team. This is March. Yeah. Uh, Donald Loyola, Chicago, Georgia state, not the same. <laughs> Picking Loyola not is a legit thing. Georgia State, I don't think so. Well, Georgia when State it happened, to, it was a legit. Now it Georgia, is. Georgia State has to play Gonzaga in their first game. It's not like it's not like they get a, you know, <laughs> oh, maybe they could they could pull this off. Like, like hey, sh- hey, hey, set the market, baby. Just just make every here's the thing. The 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 most agonizing yet satisfying moment is when you know your bracket is done. And you could just watch the games and just be happy with watching the games. And if that happens in the first day of the tournament. So be it. There was something serene last year about watching a tournament without Duke in it. Not that I enjoyed it, um, but it was a very different experience to just be like, huh, let me just let me just pick all these teams here. And, and I have no rooting interests other than not wanting Carolina to win. <laughs> uh, by the way, in the ESPN bracket, three percent of people have picked Georgia State to upset Gonzaga. Uh, so so there is a, a solid percentage of people out there who. Wow, who, who think that that miracle is going to happen? <laughs> we shall see. Hey, that's going to wrap it up for us here on our NCAA tournament preview. I am Jason Evans. He is Donald Wine. He is Sam Klein. This is the DBR podcast. We want you to write to us. Our inbox has been overflowing, but we still love to get those emails. 
write to us at dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Duke Basketball Report, signing off. Tournament coming. Here's the Duke band to play us out and take us home. The dog has decided not to join the program today. Oh, why? I don't know. Sometimes he's in, sometimes he's out. I don't want to do it anymore then. I'm out. <laughs> All right, here's my other question. Yeah. I have this bag of cut up peppers. Oh, that I delicious. Cut. Can you get them to me? I'll eat them. Hang on. I cut them like a week and a half ago. How squishy are okay. they? They're still kind of crunchy. If they're still crunchy, I think they're good, but I'm not the one to ask. I routinely eat foods that other people say, oh, you should not be eating that. My you wife can hear this crunch, right? Yeah, 100%. Yep. That seems That's good. That's a pretty strong, pretty solid crunch. And it tastes fine, the, right? They've been in this bag for a week and a half. It, it tastes fine, right? Yeah. It tastes like a pepper. Maybe like a little, you know, like I know that it's been in the fridge for a while. Like it's not like, oh my God, this is the greatest pepper I've ever eaten. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, but anyway. I, I, I almost exclusively, the only vegetable I eat for the most part is, <laughs> is uh, red orange and yellow peppers which probably shouldn't even count as vegetables but i that is the one thing i i, I don't like green foods <laughs> i know i know another guy who says he doesn't like green foods <laughs> i i do i do the green i do broccoli peas oh peas green are the worst beans. i love broccoli Ugh. i love broccoli broccoli Yo, is delicious when i was a kid when i was a kid my parents would always do um they do mashed potatoes and peas and you would like do instead of gravy you just put the peas in there and mash yeah. them up so you have like a little starchy type of starchy green thing i'm was, i'm kind good. of indifferent to peas i didn't like peas as a kid and now i'm just sort of like whatever it's if it's in my food i'll eat it but i never ordered roasted peas. roasted peas <sighs> shut it down Is that right <clears throat> oh the roasting thing my, changes changes worlds for a yeah, lot the of my wife does vegetables my, my wife does the the oven roasted um uh brussels sprouts yeah those yeah, you, so I, I I didn't even like Brussels sprouts until someone was like, yo, you just roast them with a little bit of uh, uh, balsamic vinegar and some bacon. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. OK, OK, now we're. Talking oh, so bacon. so you like bacon. <laughs> is what I you love bacon here. Bacon. <laughs> bacon makes everything better. I had uh, I had lamb bacon last week. Um, Ooh, really? Yeah. I mean, I'm not a regular bacon eater, so I can't I can't directly compare. But wow, was that delicious? Um. It, I could tell that it was ruining my life as I was eating it, but it was so, <laughs> so good. <laughs>